up guys welcome to the just pearly things youtube channel and welcome to another episode of pearl daily guys 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 you know you guys have been asking for him forever you know today we have a special guest all right but 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 before i get into that you know i have something really important first you guys need to like the video and second off guys we have a sponsor please pan to the soap blessing please there we go you know guys this soap it, it's it's one of a kind so there are these guys they got divorced right it was oh no oh no big divorce and they discovered that this pheromone soap drives the ladies crazy all right they sent me some they sent my dad some honestly i like the lotion this one's my favorite it it smells so good it smells so good. Blessing's been using it, right, Blessing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you get, okay, it's 70% of the people that buy, they buy again. And there, if you guys want to try it, use the code PEARL10. The link is in the description. So, anyways, now that I did my shameless plug. All right, guys, we have a special guest. We have two today. We have Ice White, who actually came on the show and he did one of my, my favorite pickup lines I've ever seen. You know, he came on the show. He did it for me. And then um, also we have Ross Jeffries, who's like a legend in the space. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you, Pearl. It's a pleasure to be on with you. I congratulate you on your fantastic, fantastic work ethic. Your family should be proud of you. It's an amazing work ethic. My family and my mother would be proud of you. So it's great to be on the show. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you. Loving your setup too. Uh, amazing upgrade from before. Yeah, yeah. I really, I really enjoy. I really enjoy the this setup more than the panels. The the panels were driving me nuts. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> <No way. laughs> too much drama. Yeah, you know. I just I've talked to enough OnlyFans models for a lifetime. I think. <laughs> I just think I've talked to enough. <laughs> uh, Ross, welcome to the show. So tell Thank me, you. would you consider yourself like a, a PUA? Is that what you would consider yourself? I consider myself a revolutionary thinker. I consider myself a seductionist. Uh, PUA tends to have the connotation now of someone who puts on a funny hat and does demonstrations of higher value, et cetera, et cetera. My focus when I teach my students is this, is rather than look at the behavior you want from women, whether that's having them sleep with you or give them your phone number, look at the emotional states you want them in. How do we use our language to create states of fascination, of connection, of arousal? Because my basic teaching, and again, this is not science, I'm gonna make a distinction, Pearl, when I say something that's not science, I'm going to say, this is just my map. It's only my experience. My general idea is that women see us through the emotions they feel for us. So if you want to appear more attractive, if you don't have the typical things that women look for, like social status, the ability to provide, you need to be able to trigger those very strong emotional states so she looks at looks at you through those states. So that's basically what I'm teaching men to do. And the second part of it is I am a healer. About 40 to 50% of the men who come into my events over 30 years, that's tens of thousands of people. That's not marketing. That's literally true. Have undergone some serious trauma in the home, either from bad parenting, from watching their parents go at each other, from emotional abuse to absent caregivers, you name it. So one of the differences in our orientation, and I do respect your orientation, I don't agree with your views, most of them are how you hold them, but one of our differences, I look at a lot of what you would call slutty behavior or whole behavior, not as a character flaw, but something that's driven by trauma. So that's one of the things I'd like to dive into today. Okay, so what do you... You, so you think all slutty behavior comes from trauma? No, that's not what I said. Oh, sorry. I said when people are traumatized, it interferes with their ability to form pair bonds. Mm -hmm. This is solid research if you look into anything that has to do with attachment theory. Mm -hmm. So yes, you're right. 
when you say that slutty behavior gets in the way of forming good pair bonds, you're right. But the causal arrow also goes the other way. The inability to form good pair bonds due to trauma in childhood leads to slutty behavior because slutty behavior is one way to get attention. It's a, a, a unhealthy way to do it for many, many reasons. So it goes both ways. So my basic point is what you call slutty behavior and that you sort of attribute to being morally depraved, I see as arising out of trauma. And people who are traumatized ought not to be stigmatized. They ought to be treated with compassion. Doesn't excuse their behavior. Doesn't make their behavior attractive. It just explains it in a different way. So would you link it back to like fatherlessness, I'm guessing? Is that what you mean by trauma? That's that's part of the issue. Sometimes it's sexual abuse. Sometimes they just don't have a caregiver, either mother or father, mm -hmm. who's a safe place to go to for their emotions. The child is told, you don't really feel that or get away, ignore me. In my case, when I was angry, I was told, no, you're not angry. We don't get angry in this family. So it's not just limited the father's being absent, although that certainly is a very damaging thing. I agree with you about that. Mm -hmm. That's just axiomatic. There's no arguing against that. But there are many ways in which trauma arises in family systems. Again, if you look into family systems therapy, if you look into attachment theory, there's many, many different ways. It could be chronic trauma. Chronic trauma is when it's low-grade trauma, but it's consistent. Acute trauma is something like you witness a car accident or you're sexually abused or you get shot or God forbid, like my father was a soldier, he had terrible PTSD. My take on it is men and women, all of us are traumatized in one form or another. This is a very traumatic world we live in. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the behavior that you attribute to being character flaws as a healer, I see as trauma not a moral failing or anything like that. Now, is it true that a lot of women and a lot of men have moral failings? Yes, but I don't think that's gender specific. I think it runs across all of humanity. It's mm -hmm. human, it's part of human nature. So when you say like, you said acute trauma, is that what you said? The, you said t listed two types of trauma. Can you say that again? Yes, there's chronic trauma. Mm -hmm which is low grade trauma, like having a caretaker who ignores you or being present in a family where there's no physical affection, which I'm being transparent here. Mm -hmm. That was my family. We were very, very well attended to and cared for, but there was no physical affection whatsoever. My, never got a hug from my mother, never got a hug from my father. I'm not looking for sympathy, mm -hmm. but it twisted and distorted my hunger for touch. You understand? Mm -hmm. So chronic trauma, is low grade. Acute trauma is something that's very severe. Being molested, uh, watching someone be murdered, going through a violent act, being in a car accident, being shot. That's acute trauma. So I'm, far more I'm yeah. sorry, keep going. No, you go. So I'm I'm curious, how would you explain? Because I guess sometimes I, I feel like people use trauma as an excuse. And I'll see two people from the same family come out completely different. Like, you know, I'm talking sisters two years apart. One will be the Virgin Mary. One will go crazy, you know. And, and I see this all the time. And I think because I, I have, you know, I have nine siblings. So I'm one at 10. I, I see the difference, like, in, I guess, choices that you can make in a family. Like, every, like, kid in my family, I would say, is pretty different. So I, I guess I'm just curious, like, how you would differentiate the two? Excellent question. I'm not a scientist. So when I don't know the exact answer, my honest answer okay. is I don't okay. know. My guess is some people are just hardwired to have a more reflective kind of consciousness. They can reflect on experience rather than be pulled into it. But here's another thing mm -hmm. that the research shows. The person who's able to handle the trauma better has what they call a compassionate witness. In my case, my eldest sister, well, I had another sister who passed on from cancer, but my current oldest sister, she was my compassionate witness. When I was the subject of abuse, 
she would see it. She would hold me. She would say that was wrong. So I had a compassionate witness. That's one explanation I would give. The rest of it, I really don't know. I haven't looked at the research. I don't even know if there is good research on it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I'm curious, you, you said you don't agree with me in a lot of my views. What else do you disagree yes. with? A bunch of them. And not only do I not yeah. agree with the views, I'm just, I don't mean to be insulting, but the way in which you go about them, it's mm -hmm. not nuanced thinking. Okay. So let me be very clear. I am not a feminist by any means. I'm not a leftist. I'm not a liberal. I'm a libertarian. I believe, I, I need to preface it. I will get to your question. Mm -hmm. I believe in as little government as possible. I'm very pro-science. I believe if you make a claim as far as possible, point to the research. If you don't have the research, say it's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm pro-clear thinking. And I'm also pro-basic human rights, basic democratic rights. Okay. So let's get okay. to the first one. Women, <laughs> women should not shouldn't vote. vote. Yes. Women yeah. shouldn't vote. Let's look at that. Women shouldn't vote. Mm -hmm. I believe some of your reasoning, because I did my homework on you, okay. is that women just don't know how to make good decisions. They're dumber. They're not good decision makers. Is that well, fair? Yeah, well, I would say it's because we don't do the hard jobs in society. We don't pay the majority of the taxes. So I've always said as a caveat, you know, if a woman's tax paying, not on child support, not on alimony, uh, but and um or or does an infrastructure job like she's involved in the military I, I think that would be more of an exception though than the rule so let's look at the logical extension of that idea yeah by that reasoning and by that rule men who do white collar jobs mm -hmm. accountants attorneys engineers mm -hmm. should not have the right to vote because they're not doing that hard work well if they're net taxpayers they would Okay. Yeah. Well, women pay taxes too. So what are you going to do, Pearl? Let's look at this practically, mm -hmm. Pearl. Mm -hmm. Are we going to review everybody's tax returns to see if they're qualified to vote? Mm -hmm. If we're really going to stick to your idea and take it beyond a pro uh, provocation into an actual practical idea, are we going to look at everybody's tax returns? What about people? Let me finish. Mm -hmm. What about people who one year are paying a lot of taxes because they're making a lot of money and the next year... They're not making a lot of money, and so they're not paying right. a lot of taxes. Right. Practically speaking, yeah. how do you administer it? You can't do it. Yeah, that's, that's true. number one. Okay. And number two, and number two, as a libertarian, I want as little government as possible. Mm -hmm. But as a libertarian, I think it's a basic fundamental value of any democracy. If you're subject to the laws that the government is going to impose upon you mm -hmm. by force, because that's how government imposes its law, it does it by threat of putting you in jail or harming you physically, mm -hmm. then you should have a say in what those rules are. It's just if you are being affected by those laws, you have the right to have a say in it. That's mm -hmm. just basic, fundamental human rights that's basic enshrined yeah. in the Constitution. I, I guess it, for me, it's difficult when you, you don't have any skin in the game, you know, when you have people voting for more benefits and more handouts that, that don't face the consequences of paying for them, I guess is where I, I have a problem. And, you know, I you know, the women that. shouldn't vote is more <laughs> tongue in cheek because I just think a lot of women, I mean, it, I just see a lot of useless jobs that we're doing. Uh, you know, human resources, uh, just, and I think that's and, a strong, and, and, and women that are, that's sorry, a, go ahead. Go ahead. I think that's a strong man. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay. So there are plenty of women who are judges, plenty of women who are attorneys. I know in my family, and again, this is a, yeah. just a small sample. My family, all the women are professionals. I have a sister who's an entrepreneur, multimillionaire mm -hmm. in real estate, my One of my nieces is very, very famous. I'm not going to mention her. Ice knows who she is because she doesn't want her name right. associated with Ross Jeffries. She could buy and sell all of us 20 times over. She's a two-time best-selling author. A well, she gets $25,000 yeah. per speech. 
So the and and I know, and I say this res, with respect. I'm not attacking you. Yeah. Your own mother is an incredibly successful CEO. She raised ten kids. Mm -hmm. That woman, you should be kvelling about her. Kvelling is a Yiddish word that means just glowing with joy and boasting about her mm -hmm. with total pride. So. If you're going to make it about accomplishment, then how are you going to measure that? Mm -hmm. And as far as voting for benefits, mm -hmm. that's a leftist thing. Yeah. That's not a feminist thing. That's a leftist thing. Mm -hmm. I think we have, I can't speak to the UK. Yeah. I'm assuming the UK is worse than the United States. But in the United States, the left has taken over completely. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a entitlement state. It's right. a welfare state. And now with the uncontrolled, out of control, open border, which is a leftist policy, we have more and more people on the dole. Right. And right. that, again, is a function not of gender, but of the left. Mm -hmm. um, I really, truly believe that the left is destroying the United States of America. I'm assuming it's not doing a good thing to England either. Again, I don't know. Yeah, it, it it's the same but but the women are the ones that are voting for these policies are they or is it so it's, what's your it's, data it's it's single women oh. they're the biggest swing voters and that's that's what i found when i was when i was trying to talk to like men's rights advocates um in the uk it was basically that it, it's tough for them to get any things passed because women are the biggest swing voters in elections I don't know. And, if and I just and I just didn't I didn't think that was I mean, if you look at the last election, it was like um, that it was when that was the biggest voting bloc that voted Democrat. I don't know if that's true or not. Mm -hmm. I just don't have the data. I don't know if that's true or not. But what I will say, it's people who are voting for leftist policies across the board. Mm -hmm. That's what's destroying. I don't know that it's a gender thing. I just don't. I really just don't know. Yeah. And I think it's a leftist thing. The left is, and this is going to turn into a political show, yeah. but as a libertarian, I'm against any group that's trying to grow big government. And uh, so, by the way, I think one of your policies would result in a huge growth in big government and putting people on the dole. We can get to that in a minute. Okay, okay which, go ahead. Banning divorce. Oh, I changed my mind on that, actually. Well, that's well. <laughs> wait a minute. That so one I changed my mind. Said, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Everything you so what you're saying is everything you said in the past is either untrue or doesn't bear the same amount of weight as the opinion that you're now carrying. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm. I'm saying that I used to believe in banning divorce, and then I decided that was a bad idea. Uh huh. And why is that? Um. I don't think you should force people to be together. I, I guess like I liked it in theory and then I thought about it more and I was just like, no, I know some people that are in some terrible marriages that just, they would be miserable for a lifetime if they stayed together. You know, it's like, yeah, that, that was kind of the, the thought process that I had. Okay. So what you're saying, and I, I agree with you, but yeah. what you're saying is people living together were unhappy taking away uh, in enforcing that is no longer is not uh, preserving that is no longer as important as protecting the family and protecting children you're putting individual happiness above preserving the family which i thought was one of your fundamental values the family is the building block of society yeah. now you're saying no it's personal happiness yeah, I know. I know. It kind of conflicts a little bit, if I'm being honest, but it's just... Conflicts a lot. So, yeah. so you're one of those swinging voters then. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess. No, because I don't know. I just, I've seen, especially like interviewing the, like doing the divorce documentary. It's like, I'll interview guys that have been in a sexless marriage for like five years, right? Their wives gained like I think 80% of women gain 20 pounds in the first five years, something like that. You know, and I'm just like, and they're forced to do that for life. You know, so I just, I, I know hey, it kind of conflicts, I'm, but I'm, I just, I changed I'm, my opinion on it. <laughs> listen. Yeah. Throughout my 30 year career, I've been the last person to advocate for marriage. If you want to do it, go ahead and do it. Yeah. I believe that humans are not hardwired for monogamy. Yeah. I believe that marriage is an institution that is 
based on a fantasy that you can love the same person for the rest of your life. And it's based on the idea that one person can be your best friend, can be your most passionate lover, can be your best guide, your best spouse. It's a fantasy. And it's also based on a 2,000, 3,000 year old practice. It was basically mm -hmm. a property exchange. I used to date, I'll give you, tell you a funny story. I used to date a travel nurse from Kenya. That was her culture. She was from the Kikuyu tribe. And she said to me one day, Ross, if you want to marry me, you have to give my father a hundred goats. And I said, first, this is a true story. I said, first of all, John B., I'm never going to marry you. And second, I don't know where to get goats. And third, I ain't giving anybody a hundred goats. So it was a property exchange. You got the property of the wife, the woman, in exchange for getting some good. Some That was the dowry. It was something that was given to the family that you were marrying into. So it's all based on stuff that no longer... I think if you want to do it, great. But I, it's just not a choice I would ever make. I would only do it if I wanted to have children. And even then, you know, I, I just have never been a yeah. proponent of it. Yeah. I, no, it's interesting because my, my views have evolved a little bit. I, I would still say I'm, I'm pro-marriage, but like, I don't know how you could argue it's a natural institution if it's so hard for people to do <laughs> Like the data is just not on our side when you think about it. it. It's like what percent of people are happy after 50 years or like. And I've only even, seen. Yeah, I agree, Pearl. I have only seen three happy marriages. Uh, one is in my family and the other two were between psychotherapists who told me, I said, how are you even possibly happy after 30 years of marriage? They said, we use our skills as therapists and we work on it every day and we don't have unrealistic expectations. Mm. So uh, I'm glad you changed. Yeah. I'm glad but you the, changed that. But the issue is, it's like, I do think parents together is better for children. And it seems like all the issues in society come from single mother homes. You know? Wow. That's, oh, no, no. Hold yeah. all of them. Yeah. All of them. Okay, that's, not, not that's every. A not gross, <laughs> wait a minute. This is how you think. This is yeah. why I don't like how you think. Because okay. this is not nuanced thinking, and you tend to way overgeneralize and not and not engage in nuanced thinking. Yeah, there's a lot of issues. I, that I guess, are but I guess society. in order to have conversations, we have to like speak in generalities. So I, I always All say right. I know there's exceptions, right? But it's like when you look at criminals, and eighty percent come from single mother homes. When you look at school shooters, a lot of them tend to come from single mother homes. And then you look at single father homes, they fare almost the same as two parent homes. It's like, you just kind of start to look, I look for patterns and trends. I'm not in favor of, uh, I'm not in favor of single parenthood. Yeah. Uh, when there's no possible, hear me out. I'm okay. not in favor of single parenthood where there's no possibility of the other parent participating in co-raising the child. I get what you're saying. If they just disappear, and I don't want to get you banned from YouTube <laughs> entirely, as well as demonetized, okay. we could get into the cultural aspects of that. That's partially a cultural thing, and right. I'm not going to get into it because that will get you kicked off YouTube. I don't want you to do that, but I think you know where I'm going with it. No, I actually, um, I, I don't, but okay. like what the culture right. talking about will get you kicked there's off. There's certain cultures, there's certain cultures, mm -hmm. I can't name them for the sake of wanting to keep you on YouTube, where the prevalence of single, of the mother or even the grandmother raising the child is oh. far more prevalent than yeah. in other ones. And you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, okay, I know. So, okay, you know what I'm talking okay, about. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But... So do you, I, I guess, because with the marriage thing, because my thought process was, you know, it's better for the children, but I don't know. Then I started interviewing people in these miserable marriages. <laughs> I was like, okay, I might, well, I might it's need not to second like, this opinion. Go ahead. Yeah, it's not necessarily better for the children, because if you think about it, yeah, and, and you're right about something. I would watch you in an interview, and you corrected someone quite accurately. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of domestic violence that happens in families. 25% of it, both partners are being abused. Both mm -hmm. partners are being violently abused. 
that's not good for children to watch either. That's not something yeah. that children yeah. should be watching. So that's an argument, again, that family isn't necessarily the best way to go either. Uh, and, I, and, and you can't assign, and I didn't hear you assign it, mm -hmm. but you can't assign all the blame to women. I uh, look, I got, I got to be careful. I don't want my family to watch this and, and be pissed at me. Mm. I happen to know male relatives in my immediate family mm. who are serial cheaters, right? Mm -hmm. And who have cheated in their marriages. So male men cheat in marriages. I don't know that you can show they cheat any more or any less than women do. A lot of, again, I'm going to say this overall, my view of you, Pearl, is a lot of the things that you ascribe to moral failings on the part of women are human characteristics that go across all genders. Mm -hmm. There's no data to suggest otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so one of my objections to you, I don't know whether you're doing it to be a provocateur. If you are, mm -hmm. more power to you. Mm -hmm. I, I started my career by saying things like, you don't get laid, I don't get paid, <laughs> saying things like for women, mm -hmm. getting sex is a choice, for men, getting sex is a chore. Mm -hmm. But the difference is I really believed what I was saying. Mm -hmm. I was saying the truth through being a, in a prov provocative way. I honestly don't know whether you say things to provoke. I really don't know. I'm not saying that you do mm -hmm. or whether you're saying things that you really believe in a provocative way. Mm -hmm. I just don't know. So like when you say things like, and I assume you, maybe I'm wrong, but like women have, it's a general red pill thing. Maybe you didn't say it, mm -hmm. that women have the dark triad things, narcissism, solipsism, sociopathy. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't say, that. I do think women are more narcissistic than men. I know, Not I know true. there may be, there may be literature that says otherwise, but just in my personal experience, I, I think that women are, are significantly more narcissistic. I, I okay. think I think filters women are starting to think they actually look like they're filters. Like I swear That's to God, true. when I when I go on social media, okay, and I say younger women are more attractive than older women. <laughs> you know what I get? I get married 37-year-old mothers tweeting at me their selfies proving to me that they are the epitome of hotness. My hey. God, these always get millions of views. Now, I, hey, if I do, men are broker than women like rich men. I don't get men tweeting at me <laughs> that they're poor and they can still get women. I just don't, I don't see it. I, I don't think we live in reality because I don't think men ever really correct us. Okay. I'm going to, first of all, yeah. what you did is deflect. That was a nice deflection. It was a true deflection. What you said is true, but you deflected. So okay. let me get back. I'm really good at rhetoric. I'm really good at argumentation. Okay. So you deflected. You said women are more narcissistic than men. So here's the science. The science, and this is a review published in the Psychological Bulletin 2015, drew on 365 sources, mm -hmm. including journal articles, dissertations, technical manuals, blah, 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 showing that aspects of that narcissism is more common in men than women. And further, it showed that antisocial personality disorder is more common in men than women. Now, you can have your personal observations, mm -hmm. but your personal observations are what we call in science, mm -hmm. a distorted reading of an inadequate sampling. Okay. Science, and I told you I'm pro-science and pro-clear thinking, is designed to prevent that. It's designed to prevent distorted readings of inadequate samplings. Mm -hmm. You can have your personal opinion, mm -hmm. but it's just a personal opinion based on a very small sampling. I'm telling you, the scientific research mm -hmm. shows that you're just not correct. You yeah. just aren't. Yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I still think that women are more narcissistic. So I don't know. Well, you that's know? like saying, Pearl, yeah. with respect, yeah. Hmm. That's like saying, I still think that the sun goes around the earth, even though astronomy shows otherwise. <laughs> well, I don't know, because, you know, I just think people can make up studies that say anything. And it's like they want you to not you, okay. they want you to not believe what's in front of your own eyes. And that, that's just okay. kind of what how I see it. You know, go ahead. OK, this is a, OK. This is a meta 
data study from over 355 sources. 355 sources in a meta-analysis are not going to make up, uh, are not going to make something up. That's not how science works. Okay. I'm sorry, this is a point. If you want to have that as your view, you can, okay. but it's, 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 it's anti-science and it's contrary to the facts. I'm not anti-Pearl. I admire, listen to me, I meant it when I said I admire your work ethic. Mm -hmm. I believe you went from 5,000 viewers to close to 2 million. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. I, can I swear on your show? I don't want to yeah, swear. Yeah, you can swear. It's fine. That's a fucking load of work. Mm -hmm. That's a ton of discipline. That takes vision. That takes dealing with setbacks like being unfairly demonetized. Mm -hmm. I I admire your hard work. And I also think you're anti-science and you don't do nuanced thinking. I just okay. do. It's just evident to me mm -hmm. from not only listening to you here, but watching your videos. Mm -hmm. And this is also part of red pill. Mm -hmm. This is my objection to red pill. I don't know. Red pill. I don't know if I'm red pill because... I don't know that they, they <laughs> I I don't I don't like to like I identify identify as oh shoot sorry I like identify as it because people people get mad and I don't know I just you know I just kind of give my opinions but go ahead sorry no I finished I made my point okay um you said you don't think men value purity why do you think that okay hold on just a minute that's a little bit of a misquote uh well first let's unpack what okay. specifically. In any kind of intelligent discussion, we have to define our terms. So what do you mean by, I'm going to ask you, mm -hmm. what do you mean by purity? Um, well, <laughs> I just have a list of the things you wanted to talk about, and that was number two. Okay. What? All so, right. Then let's talk so about I don't that. Know. <laughs> what I meant, all right. Okay, so what ahead. I meant is, I don't even know what purity means, but you also said men want virgins. That's my real point of contention. Yeah. This idea that men want virgins, maybe if you're a religious nutbag mm -hmm. and you and, and if you have sex before marriage, you'll offend Jesus yeah. because God doesn't want your you putting your pee pee into a woo woo before there's a ceremony. Mm -hmm. In Yiddish, they say no chuppa, no shtupa. Chuppa is the uh, the marriage thing that you stand under, and shtupa is to screw. Mm -hmm. There's not. This is the view of religious. Uh, this is like if you're a religious Catholic or Orthodox Jew, or God forbid, uh, mm -hmm. a, a fundamental mon a, a fundamentalist Islamist radical like a Taliban who will kill a woman if she's not a virgin uh, before she's married. This idea that men want virgins is completely nutty. Where you're drawing it from, I don't know. Where are um, you getting that from? Um, you know. You know what's funny? I'm sorry. It's kind of interesting because I don't know. The last couple of months, my view, my views have evolved a little bit. So, so I, I know I, I don't mean to like like switch up. I'm not doing this just because you're here. But the last couple of months, because I do think I came from a bit of like a religious worldview, and and some of that's kind of crashed the last couple months. To be honest, good, because good. it just doesn't line up um i mean i think men want in general women that are more pure rather than a whore i would say i i you know it's like most guys don't want to date a chick with only fans most guys don't want well, to date it you know of course of course <laughs> yeah but only fans how big a slice of the pop female population are only fans women now it may be true that there are more only fans girls than there are teachers which is a set, I don't know that's true. It sounds right. When yeah. you say that, you're yeah. probably right. Mm -hmm. But how big of a slice of the female population are only fans? Very small. So right. again, you're using a straw man argument by looking in at a, a distorted reading of an, uh, of an inadequate sampling. This is part of how you think. It's mm -hmm. part of the reason why you're here. I'm here mm -hmm. not to be anti-pearl, but to be pro-clear thinking mm -hmm. and to be pro-clear science. So yes, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be with be with some prostitute yeah. or a porn star and all, but that's a very, very, very small percentage. Now, you're right about another thing. Mm -hmm. You're right. I wouldn't want to be with someone who has a super high body count. Mm -hmm. Number one, because of the possibility of disease. In my case, that's not a problem because I always make sure a partner is tested. If a partner is not tested and mm -hmm. shows me the lab results and the current date, they don't get into my bed. 
Yeah. And the second thing is someone who has a high body count either is suffering a lot of serious trauma mm -hmm. or they and or the other way around, a high body count will prevent them from having the ability to properly pair bond. And I don't want someone like that, particularly at my age. I'm 65. I'm not looking mm -hmm. to do a bangerang. I went through those days when I just created speed seduction. I I my openness is to a life partner who doesn't want to sign that piece of paper. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could see that, but I don't know. The, you know, actually, I found, I found that virgins nowadays have such bad personalities that, sorry, this is, this is going to be anecdotal, so I'm sorry, but I found that virgins nowadays, it's like a lot of times they have nothing else. And so men, like, find that they come with other issues. Um, yeah. While you're changing your mind, and this, you're <laughs> opening yourself up to Rabbi Ross and saying you change your mind on divorce, you change your mind on this. Well, I, think, well, I, think, well, I think men want more pure women. Like, I, I don't I don't disagree with that. I think you don't think the ideal would be a virgin. I'm curious as to like, why? I, 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 no, <laughs> like, why would you why would bed. you want a guy like a crappy, girl? Hold on. Oh, God, 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 you God, asked God, me a God, question. Yeah, yeah, Please God. permit me to answer. Yeah, God. Virgins are crappy in bed. They don't know what they're doing. They sit there. Forgive me. I've been inadvertently with a few virgins. They sit mm -hmm. there. And this sounds horrible. They sit there. They lay there. They cake it and they bleed all over me. Mm -hmm. I don't want any part of it. Why, why? What value is there in being a virgin? Uh, maybe you're Catholic and believe in the Virgin Mary, <laughs> but that's the only virgin I see. Mm -hmm. If I were Catholic, that has any value. What? What is the value? Now, I know the biblical thing. The biblical thing is that virgins had more inherent value because you knew that if you had a child mm -hmm. with that person, it wasn't someone else's child right. back in the day. And they were viewed as property. They were just viewed as worth a thousand goats instead of a hundred goats. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why from the perspective of any man. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say that some of my students haven't wanted that. You have to understand. I've seen the whole gamut, 30 years, tens of thousands of guys teaching them how to have choice and power and selectivity with a woman. I've only had one student who really wanted a virgin. I'll never forget really? him. Really? Yeah. Wow. His name was Tom. Tom's good Catholic boy. He wanted to lose his virginity on his wedding night, yeah. but he knew he had to date a lot of women to find someone who would make a good partner. Mm -hmm. So Tom... I taught him how to attract women and to have selectivity and choice. But I've only, again, this is anecdotal, but it's a huge sample. It's yeah. like tens of thousands of people. What Pearl, I asked you, mm -hmm. really, objectively, setting the biblical religious part aside, mm -hmm. what is the value in someone being a virgin? I guess I, I would say you you don't. I mean, like, how do I put it? Like, you don't want a girl that has exes to go back to, you know, but I, I guess maybe with social media, it kind of switches things a little bit. I'm um, confident enough in my ability to attract and hold a woman because mm -hmm. I know speed seduction. I'm confident enough that a woman is not going to go back to an ex <laughs> because I know how to evoke. I'm serious. I'm not yeah. joking. I know how to evoke those emotional states. I know how to give her the emotional states, the emotional highs, and the emotional lows that she's not going to find anywhere else. Mm -hmm. She may leave me because she feels that she's just unfulfilled, and people grow apart. Listen, I have a, a proclivity for dating much younger women. Mm -hmm. The last woman I dated uh, was 43 years younger. And some people may go, that's gross, that's sick. I say, no, that is a natural, natural male tendency to value beauty and youth. Don't say right. it on X. They'll tweet selfies. <laughs> well, I, I'm not on X. I don't like social media because I think social media is contributing to the destruction of Western civilization. We can get to that if you want to. Okay. But nonetheless, she outgrew me. Mm -hmm. She just, uh, after two or three years, she just became a different, a different person. Mm -hmm. Look, 
a person's brain isn't fully formed until they're 25. The person they are at 19, this is the danger of dating someone who's really younger. I, I do it because it's worth it to me. But the danger is their brain is going to mature. They're going to be a different person. This is also the problem with the notion of marriage lasting forever. The person you marry when you're 20, I don't think people should get married that young. They have no their ass from their elbow. They're going to be a different person when they're yeah, 25 or when they they're are. 30. Yeah. Their, their view is going to grow. My sister, I'm not going to say which one, was very happily married for a long time. And then she said, you know, my vision of what I wanted our life to be like grew apart. I spoke to her husband, who, her ex-husband, who had nothing but great things to say about my sister. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, I, I'll always love your sister. She's an amazing woman. But our vision grew apart. I wanted more children. She didn't. People grow apart. So if you're going to go after younger women, I teach how to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, it's one of my favorite things that my guys like to learn. I also warn them of the dangers of doing it. So Pearl, you're right. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with you about virginity, but mm -hmm. you sure are right as rain when it comes to men want youth and men want beauty. Mm -hmm. Now, when you tell modern feminazis this, and I'm not a feminist, I said this at the very beginning, mm -hmm. here's where they're delusional. They don't want to believe it. They're insulted by hearing it. And you're right to stand up to it at the at the danger of being censored. Mm -hmm. I've seen this over and over and over again. This young woman who I dated, who was uh, 18 when I started dating her, her mother was in her 40s and said, I'm going to go have hot girl summer. When she had a 30-pound pot belly, she had a nose piercing. You don't have a nose piercing when you're in your 40s. Mm -hmm. So I get it. It's not that I disagree with everything you say. It's... I think a lot of what you say, I, honestly, Pearl, I'm, I'm doing my best to look into you, you in the eye virtually. I don't know how much of this you really believe and how much you're provoking. And there's nothing. I started my career as a provocateur, mm -hmm. as someone who provoked people to build a following. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on social media. It was through TV shows, chat shows, as you would say, in Britain. So I know a provocateur when I see one <laughs> and I'm looking at one. <laughs> I get this a lot. I know people always say that to me that they don't think I believe the things I say. I do really, you? I no, I really do. I don't know why people always say that. I do change my opinions at times. So, you know, I, I'm kind what of a. Tell I'm, you what? If you change your radically, it's not like you change your opinion. Like I like polka dots. I yeah. don't like polka dots. If you're changing fundamental opinions, mm -hmm. like divorce, ban divorce should yeah. be banned, things like that. And uh, the idea about purity and et cetera, et cetera. If you're changing fundamental views, what are you going to do? Do you, as a huge voice, someone has a huge following, have a responsibility to go back to all those people mm -hmm. who have been convinced to hold those views by you and now go back and somehow communicate to all of them and say, you know what? I misled you unintentionally. Mm -hmm. It wasn't intentional, but I misled you. I led you to a view that is not the most healthy one. Mm -hmm. Will you take responsibility for that as someone who has a giant voice? Can you take responsibility for that? What do you mean by responsibility? You want me to go say can sorry? You somehow, <laughs> like, do you want me to say sorry? Can you somehow, <laughs> for, can you somehow, yeah. mm -hmm. can you somehow put out a uh, significant number of videos where you mm -hmm. say, you know what, guys, I changed my mind. Don't follow my previous advice. Is there a way for you to do it? Yeah, there, but I there... guess I guess I wouldn't look at it as advice before. Like, I, I wouldn't say if I think divorce should be banned, that's like telling you how to live. You know, I Isn't mean, that's it? just it's worse than that. No, but it's, that's just the policy government. But that's just a policy that I, that I used to think. But it's not well, like any policies changed because I said that, you know. Yeah. But when you advocate for it, when you used to advocate it up yeah. until God knows how when, yeah. that's a government policy. Yeah. That well, would have to be enforced. Yeah, I get, that sorry, that go. grows government. Mm -hmm. That grows government. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, you're the very opposite of the conservative you claim to be. Conservatives don't want to grow big government. The more that yeah. you take the government and you make a law that affects individual people, mm -hmm. the more you're growing government power. As a libertarian and a true conservative, I find that repellent. 
yeah. and this is where I think you you honestly don't see how some of the things you advocate for would lead to bigger government. Yeah. No, I understand the marriage one. I really, I really changed my mind on the divorce thing. I just, I've seen too much, I guess. Um, but I, I guess I wouldn't really look at it as advice. It was just kind of my thoughts at the time, you know. You're, you're underestimating your power. You have, you're underestimating, this is both a compliment, I don't know if it's a criticism. You're mm -hmm. underestimating your power as someone who's an incredible influencer Mm -hmm. who people take your word as being not just your opinion, but as being true with a capital T. Mm -hmm. I know these dangers because my students look up to me as a guru. I've been called the sex messiah of the nerds. Right. My, my students, if you ever can, I don't do seminars anymore. I do the AI thing. And if you want to pay me 50 grand mm -hmm. to come for a weekend, I'll think about it. But the thing is, is I had to learn that my students wanted someone to obey. I surrounded myself with people. This is true. Mm -hmm. I knew that that was a danger. I knew that my own little bit of narcissistic tendencies, that would turn into a poison for me. Mm -hmm. So I surrounded myself with people who would say, hey, Ross, you're full of shit. You're way out of bounds. Mm -hmm. These people are looking up to you as their guru, you better let them know that this is just your opinion. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say to you is I think you're underestimating the power of your voice. Mm -hmm. you, they may, you may indeed just be giving your opinions, mm -hmm. but the incels, and I think a lot of your audience, I can't prove it, are incels okay. who mm -hmm. listen to you are taking it as the gospel, are taking it mm -hmm. as the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think to that extent, you're underestimating your power and as my favorite philosopher Spider-Man said, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. So if you had that power and it influenced people to take it as the truth, mm -hmm. I think on some way, and I don't know how you do it, you have the responsibility to make it very, very clear mm -hmm. that your opinions have changed. Uh, not just say it once or twice in a short, mm -hmm. but make it very clear to those people that they're now off base because of what you said prior mm -hmm. that they took to be true. I know, I believe you. I can read body language. I can read facial expressions. When you say that you view it just as your opinions, mm -hmm. I get it. But the majority of the people watching you mm -hmm. don't. They view it as true. But why would they why would they view it? It's not like you're God. I mean you give your opinions, I give my opinion. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. It's but, like every every person gives their opinions based on, you know. That's their, a function. Their, yeah. That's a function of the psychology of your audience. I'm yeah. willing to bet. And again, this isn't science. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This is my intuitive read. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. My guess is a huge portion of your audience are men who are pissed off at women mm -hmm. because they're not getting any. They're incels, and they they are going. To, they're far more likely to take your opinions as true with a capital T because they're very emotionally charged in the way they look at you. Mm -hmm. That's just my that's just my take. I am actually saying to you mm -hmm. that you have more. Your voice has more power than you think. It's not just giving. And as you grow more famous, mm -hmm. and good on you that you are growing more famous because that's your hard work. I don't agree with a lot of your opinions. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with your thinking, which is often unnuanced, mm -hmm. but good on you because you're doing it through a hell of a lot of hard work and through continuing to grow your skills as a provocateur, good on you. Mm -hmm. But the bigger your audience grows and the more persuasive you become, mm -hmm. the more people are going to take it as less being only your opinion, they're going to take it as being true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you said that you think men are equally, oh, we talked about the narcissistic. So women are not more emotional than men. Why do you think that? Yeah. Okay. This is nuanced thinking. Okay. So let me, allow me to be nuanced. I'm going to, I'm going to adjust a chord really quick but I'm going to okay. let you go just one second. All right. Hold on. This is fun. This I love this. this chair, like died on me. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. 
Okay, so you think that women are not more emotional than men? Yes. So let's let's parse that out and do some nuanced thinking here. There's emotional experience and there's emotional expression. Okay. Okay. I, my observation, and again, it's not science, is that men and women experience emotions equally. If we didn't have emotions, we wouldn't survive as a, a species. But emotional expression is far more likely to come out of a woman's mouth than a man, because men are socialized that to not talk about it. We are mm -hmm. told, uh, again, I don't want to swear in your show. Can I say the P word? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Well, that yeah. one get us. No, don't, don't say that one. I'm, I'm trying okay. to get remonetized. Men are called, men are yeah, called yeah, yeah. P bleep if they express. So mm -hmm. Women are, tend to be more emotionally expressive and more explosive in their emotional expressions. That's number one. Mm -hmm. So make a distinction between emotional experience and emotional expression. But the second thing, and this is my observation, both from dating tons of women and working with tens of thousands of men, literally, not as a marketing thing. I think that men and women are equally emotional. And this is a perspective I guarantee you've never heard before. Mm -hmm. And nor is your audience. So listen up. Men tend to be linear in our emotions. When we're angry, we're angry. When we're sad, we're sad. When we're aroused, we're aroused. When we're happy, we're happy. Women's emotions are what we call recursive. They have emotions about their emotions. Mm -hmm. A woman could be attracted, but she could be curious about her attraction. She could be ashamed of her curiosity about her attraction. She could be proud of her shame. Do you understand? Women have emotions. Yeah, sort of. About their emotions. And so this looks like crazy. Not to say that a lot of women aren't batshit crazy, but this looks like crazy because we're running on different operating systems. Mm -hmm. Just as a metaphor, men are running on Mac, uh, on Mac, and women are running on Windows. So it looks like crazy because we're expressing as males in a linear way. Women are expressing in a recursive way, which means in a loop, mm. emotions about emotions. But the third thing is um, women are more emotionally unregulated than men. Uh, and by unregulated, I mean they're more likely to be triggered. They're unable to self-soothe. They don't know how to calm themselves down. And they don't know how to finally take on a different perspective. They don't, I think this is not taught in society. No one even knows about emotional regulation. It should be taught in schools along with financial literacy. Mm -hmm. So men and women have experience emo express emotions differently. They experience them differently. And finally, women are told that if they're emotionally unregulated and they're expressing it that way, that means they're feminine. They're defined, their femininity they're told, well, this is your divine femininity. Oh, when God. you get hysterical, oh, that's God. being feminine. God, and then they resent us as men. Yeah. They resent us as men when we don't value it. So, do so you, this, do you, sorry, I have yeah. a question. Do you think that's because, um, like, do you think that's because women are not taught to do that? And we're just like, or do you think that's more a biological thing? I think it's both. Okay. I think, I think it's both. I think no one's taught to emotionally regulate. I Look, I went through two years of something called DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy, mm -hmm. that teaches incredible tools to emotionally regulate. <clears throat> but no one knows about these tools. But partially, it's biological, not always. I've dated a lot of women. Some of them, when they're on their period or when they're ovulating, they go nuts. Uh, we don't have that problem as men. Yeah. Our testosterone levels may rise and fall mm -hmm. during any given month, but that's for sure. But it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is their responsibility to, to not act down on in a way that drives their man crazy. Cause I don't want to be around that. Okay. So sorry, I'm trying to understand that. So can you explain what you said about the, the women, like, change like could you sorry could you explain that one more time i don't think i get it <laughs> which part the the part about the difference in like <laughs> when and women doing them like do having them like how you think men are just as emotional you said like they express okay. it differently I'll say it again. yeah go ahead yeah 
men have our emotions in a linear fashion. When we're angry, we're angry. Mm -hmm. When we're sad, we're sad. When we're aroused, we're aroused. When we're happy, we're happy. Women have emotions about their emotions. A woman can be turned on, but she could be ashamed of her being turned on. Mm -hmm. She could be curious about her shame about being turned on. Mm -hmm. She could be happy about her curiosity about her shame about being turned on. They run in loops. Rather than going linear and running straight. Oh. Does that, that actually, make sense No, that now? makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, because it's like, it's like we'll have the initial emotion and then we'll almost like react to it. And then yes. have a different and, emotion. And then feel guilty yes. or feel happy. Oh, that makes a lot of sense, yes. actually. I've never thought yes. about it that way. Well, I am a breakthrough revolutionary thinker. I come from a very, very smart family and i'm not the smartest one in my family the women i hate to tell you are the smartest ones in the it. family they're also <laughs> the most successful <laughs> it's true yeah and look at you look how successful you are yeah By the but way, I, I talk in a microphone i mean it's not like yeah but you're pearl <laughs> yeah, don't be ahead. falsely modest you're very successful now as a matter of fact let me ask you this being mm -hmm. consistent I want to I want to challenge you on consistency. I don't want to be mean about it. I've seen people be very mean and, and and also be mean to you when they're not even in your presence, which is a, a double cheap shot. They're cheap shotting you and they're making it a double cheap shot because they don't give you an opportunity to respond. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. Would you as a very intelligent and successful woman okay and would you give up your right to vote? If all if all the other girls are going with me, <laughs> not not by really? myself, yeah, no, I, I I just think women are always going to vote for abortion. Like I just think that that that's always what they do I, before. Whoa. No, that's always Three. always every election season. There's always some thirteen year old that can't get an abortion. They run it or like Roe versus Wade or or something. Thirteen that, year olds. That, what reality are you living in where 13 year olds can vote? First of all, no, no, no. I'm Second, saying, I'm saying it's like a news story. So, like, like there's always something before the elections. I've just noticed it, all right? Or some sob story that gets us running to the polls. With all due respect, Pearl, mm -hmm. you're not paying attention to politics in the United States because the right wing Christian voting bloc mm -hmm. has it's an odd paradox. It's either the left wing liberal loonies are the right wing Christian evangelist vote that swings elections and they are all totally anti-abortion mm -hmm. and they want to make it give women the some of them want to give women jail time well, so I don't again mm -hmm. I'm ignorant yeah of politics in, in England I don't know how it works there mm -hmm. but here in America I know you were born in Chicago right I don't know when you left Mm -hmm. um, here in America, the right-wing Christian vote that's radically anti-abortion and pro-life is controlling things. They are, they have a tremendous amount of power, and so I, I think that's not entirely true. Even if you so. even if you look at like maps of the last hundred years, if um, like if women didn't vote, it would always be conservative. And I'm not saying that's the reason. Like it, it still goes back to I, I don't think. I don't know how you would apply it practically, so I guess that's probably where you're, you're going to keep going. Like, how would you apply it? But I just I don't think it's fair that people that don't pay taxes still get the same say as some as the people that do. Like, I, I think you have to have some skin in the game. The people that are doing the infrastructure jobs are have the same, or that that aren't doing the infrastructure jobs have the same say as the people that are doing it. So what you're saying to me mm -hmm. is that by that reason, mm -hmm. people who pay less taxes, regardless of their gender, mm -hmm. shouldn't be voting. Many who are not net. Oh taxpayers yeah, no. Oh, I've said. Voting. Oh, I've said this too. I just think. Okay. So, I just. I, so should, I just think. I just think women are the Isn't first ones. I think. I think. I think. I think women are the first ones that gotta go. I, I don't know. Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that fundamentally? See, that's why I have to call you out. Yeah. That's fundamentally a statist. Um, almost, I don't want to use fascist because that's an overused word, mm. but it is a authoritarian and anti-democratic 
way of doing things. If mm -hmm. you are affected by the laws, I would say if the laws are not going to be applied to you, then you don't have to vote. But if you have mm -hmm. to follow the laws, then you should have a say in the government, whether you oh, pay no. taxes or not. Look That's at... number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, number two, by your reasoning, by your reasoning, it's no longer a gender thing. It's no longer women shouldn't vote. Well, I it's, think they should go first. Not, if I could finish, <laughs> yeah, sorry. If I could finish. Mm -hmm. I've been very polite to you. By your reasoning, it's not women who shouldn't be allowed to vote. It's women. It's people who are not net taxpayers should not be allowed to vote. So it's no longer a gender thing, and it's yeah. impossible to enforce. Yeah. You're not going to be able to give a tax. Look at everybody's tax returns. My whole thing is a libertarian, mm -hmm. little government as possible. If you're subject to the rules and the laws of the government, mm -hmm. then you have a right. You have the fundamental, fair, basic human right to participate in that and have some say in what those laws are going to be. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it becomes a dictatorship. And I don't like dictatorships. Well, but I guess how would you combat the people that just keep voting for benefits and like they, they vote for things that kill the entire system you change yeah. you change the laws at, at a higher level and say we just don't allow for these benefits you can yeah. vote all you like you change the laws you change the laws and you go to the courts and say this is fundamentally unconstitutional to rob peter to pay paul again i'm a yeah. libertarian I don't like the idea of wealth transfers. I believe taxation fundamentally is theft. I believe the draft is a form of involuntary servitude. It's a form of slavery. Uh, my political views are pretty radical and actually uh, you think consistently. It's a, you think it's a form of slavery? It's involuntary servitude to mm -hmm. take someone against their will, against their will, and essentially make them property. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to volunteer, that's a different story. But yeah, I think it's essentially a form of involuntary servitude. Mm -hmm. It violates the 13th Amendment. But now we're diving into politics and constitutional law. No, I was just curious. Is, I, I, I've never heard that before. So I was just curious. I have. Listen, mm -hmm. I may be a genius, but I'm also bat bleep crazy. <laughs> I'm the first person to admit it. Mm -hmm. And some of my views are off the wall. Interesting. I've never heard that one. Um, you don't think the media caters to women. Why do you think that? The media caters to the left and now to anti-Semites. I'm Jewish, and there's a wave of anti-Semitism anti going everywhere. The media caters to the left. It now caters to wokeism. I'm the most anti-woke person you can imagine. And let me define the disgusting aspects of this disgusting thing called woke. First of all, it's the idea that feelings are more important than facts, that the degree to which you've been oppressed or have suffered determines your merit. I'm a child of the 60s. Back in the 60s, I know I'm a dinosaur, but each of these gray hairs is a silver strand of wisdom that you can learn from. Okay. Back then, when I was a child, things went by merit. You were awarded according to what you could produce, what you could achieve. We were taught, I was taught, my whole family was taught by our parents, do your best, keep your word, be generous to others, show others basic respect. Those values are now laughed at. So wokeism is the idea that feelings are more important than facts, that your, the group that you belong to is more important than what you do as an individual, and the degree to which you've suffered is the degree to which you earn merit. And furthermore, if someone offends you, that should be a crime. In Canada, I know because I have Canadian friends, in Canada, it's actually hate speech if you don't use someone's, and I think this is BS too, I don't want to get you demonetized, I agree with your opinions on this. Uh, <laughs> if you don't use someone's preferred pronouns, mm -hmm. it's a hate crime. So this is... What does that say? Nova Scotia. Oh, you're Canadian? Okay. So that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know where this is going or how that tangent came out. 
Well, no, it was just I'm one. Of, it was just one of the things that it said you wanted to talk about the the media. But so the media caters to the left, mm -hmm. and the media is captured. The media is a captured um, group of corporations. It's captured by big pharma. In England and in Europe, it's not you're not allowed to advertise pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Here in the United States, if you put on Fox, CNN, which I call the Communist News Network, Fox, CNN, uh, News Nation, any of these cable news shows, every three minutes you see an ad for a pharmaceutical. New Abrevia may cure your emphysema, but side effects, mm -hmm. side effects, uh, death, death, death. Death, death, death. It's uh, I'm so the media is captured by by big pharma and it caters to the left. It may it yeah. There's a small subsection that caters to women mm -hmm. and says that women are victims and and men are all are all um, horrible things. I agree with you on this stuff. This horrible trope of toxic masculinity mm -hmm. if you believe in toxic masculinity then the next time you're being robbed hope that a woman policeman shows up not that women shouldn't serve on the police force, oh i i think that but, uh, <laughs> no, right if i if i call the cops and a woman comes i'm suing i'm suing well, <laughs> I'm well so mad hey, i happen to have a dear friend who's a motorcycle <laughs> cop in san diego she could kick most men's ass <laughs> That's a she's an exception to the rule. Yeah. I also think that that and this is fact. Mm -hmm. I would want a man, a male and a female officer showing up. The male officer can handle it if it turns violent. Female officers are better at de-escalating situations. So I think there, there's a place for both. But my major point is the media caters to the left and it's captured in the United States by big pharma. And also. The media, now we're talking about social media. Mm -hmm. Social media has created a, I said this once in a talk, not regarded to seduction, but regarded to the sales training part of my business, because that's part of what I've done is transition to teaching seduction for sales. I said the entire Western civilization is orbiting around the dark star of narcissism and ADHD. And I think social media has done that. Social media has increased narcissism. Everyone shows how great their life is, how beautiful their boobs are, their new dress. You don't think that social would... media affects women more, though? How do you mean, Pearl? In what sense? Like, as in, I, I just see women being much more into social media than men. Do you think that's not true? You know, like, I, I see women, you know, maybe I'm biased because these women keep tweeting their selfies at me. <laughs> I, but well, I, I just see like women, like women are on their phones more. Women are building brands more. Um, I, I, you're right about building brands. Yeah. I don't know that they're on their phones more. Um, and they're going to tweet selfies to you because you're an attractive young woman. Go with the, get used to it. Go with the territory, darling. <laughs> don't complain about the cost that comes with your benefit. Give up your beauty premium oh, if you don't like what it costs. <laughs> See what a flatter I am looking yeah, at your you are. <laughs> I know. Hey, I know how to work a woman. But <laughs> let me let me finish the point. Mm -hmm. I think that this thing here, it's everywhere. I was out at breakfast mm -hmm. uh, at my favorite Mexican restaurant. I saw a family of four sit down. Man, uh, mother, father, two kids. None of them were talking to each other. They all had the phone in their faces. This is addictive. This is a dopamine hit machine. It's designed and engineered to be addictive. So I think social media is destroying everybody. Whether or not women are the primary users in terms of creating content, um, I don't know. I really don't know. You may be right. You may not be right. Uh, but I just think it's responsible for a lot of narcissism. Narcissism is... Uh, look, all of the United right. States, again, I can't speak for Britain, forgive me, and then I'll let you speak. I know you have something important to say. I can only speak for the United States, but this country is being destroyed by narcissism and ADDHD and me, 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 and 
Everyone can be a Kardashian. Everybody wants to be famous. When I was a child, it was perfectly okay to be middle class, to work a nine to five job, to have one car. You didn't need to be famous. You didn't need to be rich. Now we're sold a bill of goods. You think marriage is a bad bill of goods? Mm -hmm. What we're being sold as an ordinary life is an impossible bill of goods. It's designed. There's a book written in the 20s by a guy named Edward Bernays, B-E-R-N-A-Y-S, called really Propaganda. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah, I know him. Okay, so Bernays was a person who was responsible for getting women to smoke. He framed it as a form of freedom and liberation. And he also was the person to get Americans to eat bacon. Bacon is actually the fat on the back of a pig. Bernays said the purpose of all marketing is to get a person to compare themselves to others. And so this is what we have. We have a marketing society that's getting people to constantly feel like they're not enough. That leads to narcissistic focus on yourself. And because of this thing, it leads to ADHD. So the big overall picture, circling back, because I've been using my NLP skills to open and close loops on you, mm -hmm. circling all back to the idea the media doesn't cater to women. The traditional media, it caters to the left. It gives women, social media gives women a better platform to get attention. Mm -hmm. I grant you that. But I don't think the media caters to women. I think it caters to the left. I think in that sense, it's extremely destructive. We hold similar political views on left-wing politics. I'm sure we do. But I guess my my point would be that if women are making 80% of consumer buying decisions, how can we say that like the ads aren't targeted towards women? You know, that the that the media, you know, because everyone's selling something. First of all, mm -hmm. you may be right about the statistic. I would like to ask where you're pulling it from. How do you know that? You may be right. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you're wrong, Pearl. I'm asking what's your source. I don't remember off the top of my head, but you can Google it. It's like, it's usually at the top of Google. Okay. Is that consumer goods? Is that major purchases like cars? Mm -hmm. What is that? I'm asking for you, not attacking. Mm -hmm. I'm asking for you to unpack it, to clarify it. Uh, what kind I just, of buying? I just, I just know it's consumer buying decisions. I, I don't know the, the depth of it. That could be household goods. That could be... Uh, it could be lesser expensive items. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but I this... guess, and, and even anecdotally, like my, um, I have a cousin that's a car salesman, right? And he, he'll always, he'll always tell me that it's like the wife you have to get on board. And I've just heard similar stuff to that, like, you know, my whole life pretty much. That's usually, yeah. hey, I also teach sales. Usually that's a smoke screen and a stall. And you have to inter inter do what I call a pattern interrupt. So if I'm teaching sales training and someone says, uh, I need to talk to my spouse using NLP, neurolinguistic neuro programming, I would say, of course you do. It's important she also get on board with us so she can also see this is a great decision. So I'm reframing the whole thing that myself and the prospect already agree on it. It's just a matter of getting the wife on board to see it. I think that's often a smokescreen. Mm -hmm. But look, if you're making a major purchase that's going to affect family finances, probably both partners should be involved. This also gets to something else. I was in doing my research for this, mm -hmm. and again, this is only America. I can't speak to the UK. 40% mm -hmm. of Americans are now relying on credit cards for just basic, yeah, basic survival needs. That's telling me that both men and women are affected by a bad economy, and they're both making poor, yeah, poor decisions yeah, when it comes true. to money. Mm -hmm. They're making poor decisions when it comes to money. It's not just women who are doing it. Mm -hmm. It's men, too, or you wouldn't see credit card debt like that mm -hmm. across all genders. Mm -hmm. So does, does the media cater to women in terms of what they're marketing? I don't know. I see ads for sports cards with men driving them. Uh, the ads for beauty products, I'm sure that's catering to women. Right. So again, Pearl, yeah. my challenge to you as an influencer, as you move forward in your career, and I don't, look, 
you're too good at what you do and you have too big a following for anyone to ever shut you down completely. Mm -hmm. You'll have more challenges. My challenge to you mm -hmm. is if you want to grow a bigger audience, get a little bit more nuanced in your thinking. You will, you already show up as extremely intelligent. If you want to intimidate people to the point where they don't even want to debate you. I, I mean this as an old grandpa giving a grant, a pseudo granddaughter advice, mm -hmm. take on the power and the discipline and being more nuanced in your thinking mm -hmm. because you'll have a lot more influence mm -hmm. and you'll duck the criticism. I've watched some of the uh, videos criticizing you and they were pretty cruel. They made a point, though, that your thinking is often not nuanced. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a maybe. And this sounds like I'm being condescending. I apologize for that if I am. You're also very young. You're not even 30 years old. So like you said, your opinions are changing. That's a good thing because your thinking is growing more nuanced. If you want to turn to Grandpa Ross for more advice on that, I'm always available for you. <laughs> My fees roll out at twenty five hundred USD an hour, but I'll give <laughs> I'm you. I'm demonetized. Break. Could I get like a five dollar? <laughs> the demonetized no, you de rate. <laughs> you've been demonetized, which I think is really sickening. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really disgusting. People should be allowed to pay for what they want to see, but this again is this again is censorship. This again is the idea that if you offend someone. You should be shut down. That uh, That is contrary to my libertarian views. I'm a libertarian through and through. I'm a free speech purist. Now, I don't like the idea that you brought Fuentes on because he's being Jewish. Mm. Uh, Holocaust deniers pain me. That, that hurts personally. Mm -hmm. But you shouldn't have been attacked. You shouldn't. If Were you demonetized for that? Or... Um... I don't know. I I was really God. I was so mad about that whole thing. But yeah, because uh, freaking yeah. No, he um. Th that's not why they officially. But people have said to me they think it is. But I, I don't officially. They told me it's because I said um, Fanny, but with a T and an R. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So I don't know. But there's hey. people that speculate that was why. But I don't actually know. Hey, I understand. I live in Hillcrest. Yeah. This is the, I live in San Diego. I live in Hillcrest. This is the, uh, the LGBTQ plus capital of San Diego. Mm -hmm. And I generally am supportive of it where I'm not supportive of it. Mm -hmm. I'm considered to be an ally, someone who supports their basic rights. And I do. Where I'm not an ally is where someone says, if you don't use my pronouns, I'm going to shame you over it. I will use someone's pronouns out of respect, mm -hmm. out of basic human respect. That's what my parents taught me. Mm -hmm. But the minute you try to shame me or shut me down for not using them, then you're going to have a fight on your hands. And again, mm -hmm. um, I applaud you for walking that line, for walking the line. You're learning, as I learned very, excuse me, had lunch and I'm old. <laughs> um, I learned very early on to be, to, well, I was outrageous. You know, oddly enough, Pearl, no one ever tried to cancel me. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because you don't pick on an old guy or I'm a legend. Uh, I am a living legend. I don't know. Um, so I've never undergone that attempt to be canceled. And I hope they don't cancel you. I hope they just people just come on and challenge you as I've been challenging you. Yeah, I mean they don't. It was because I was talking about um, I play volleyball in the UK, and so basically, oh, wow. yeah. So what what happened? Outside hitter? Were you outside? No, I'm hitter? a I'm a middle. Middle blocker. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there was a a tournament last year where they had like I said it was like a team of fannies. If you catch my drift. That we had a to team like of what of, of of guys basically that we had to play Got against, it. and they were like I in our you. locker room and stuff. And so I was yeah. talking about it, and then they, yeah, they demonetized me. So yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think <laughs> yeah, that's I know. A horrible thing. Yeah, but eh, what are you, what are you gonna do? You know, other than if if the YouTube rep is watching, say please let me back in. <laughs> please, hey, God. If, the YouTube, if YouTube reps are watching me, 
<laughs> I'm not on YouTube, so. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Well, by the way, about that uh, statistic, um, eight, seventy to eighty percent of all consumer purchasing mm-hmm. decisions are women. This is from Forbes. Um, so yeah, that that is correct. And there's a number specific. Uh, that that's a general one, but a specific one. For example, seventy percent of travel consumers are women. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I stand, I stand corrected. I am someone who likes to learn. So if someone's got a better point, good on them. Uh, I just got educated. I love that. Anyone who can teach me something that I don't know is. It has risen in my estimation. So good. Thank you, Ice. We'll talk about it later, you traitor. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> so I'm curious. It, no, wait, Pearl, Pearl, yeah. one thing. Mm-hmm. Before we went on the air, you said that you like you watched some of my videos and you liked some of my pickup lines that they would totally work on you. Oh yeah. Sure, right? Yeah, because I would I would have been so entertained if someone said I they could um tell me about my handwriting or something you would one like that and i was like wow that that would i was like that i would stop i would totally stop (laughs) remember guys i am the og yeah go ahead you were gonna say something no i was gonna i I was gonna ask you about the pickup stuff so you've been doing it for 30 years yeah over 30 years i wrote my first book in 1988 and so that you are in the last years of your previous lifetime, young lady, when I first got into this. <laughs> well, I was curious because you had some stuff about like conversation patterns. Yes. And I was wondering yes. if you could like tell me about that, if you don't mind. Sure. Sure. So what I teach my guys is don't have this. I want to make this distinction very clear. Don't ever lie, but don't have fact based conversations. I'll give you an example. What's the difference between asking the question, what do you like to do for fun, which every chump has asked you, and this question, when you want to do something that makes you feel totally alive and get your heart beating hard and time flies by, what do you love to do? Or what's something you've always fantasized, dreamed of doing, but haven't let yourself dare? Now, those are two fundamentally different questions. One just seeks a factual answer, Mm -hmm. ends the conversation. The other is designed to wake up a woman's emotions. It deals with themes of adventure, fantasizing, um, doing something that she doesn't ever dare to do. Do you understand how it evokes something completely different? Can you feel that and see it? Yeah, I I was thinking about the question. I'm like, I don't even know how to answer that. But it makes you think. (laughs) Yeah, it makes you think, and more importantly, given the right rapport, it makes you fantasize. Now, does it make you sexually fantasize? Not necessarily, but give this metaphor. Consider this metaphor. I've stayed in my travels in some pretty cheap hotels, motels, where the rooms are separated by just a thin wall. And if someone's partying in the room next to you, it's going to keep you up at night. Consider that part of a woman's mind that fantasizes about anything to be one room. And then in the other room is the room where she sexually fantasizes. If you can wake up that fast, that first room, chances are the noise is going to wake up the second. So that's one example. A second example is to, uh, how can I put this? Is to tell stories in a way that evoke a woman's imagination. I'll give you a very simple one. Mm -hmm. I will be out. I've used this to turn female friends into lovers. It's got a hundred percent success rate. I shouldn't give it away, but I'm going to give it away, uh, and it's going to offend a lot of women. So guys, guys can't escape the friend zone. Guys can escape the friend zone. (laughs) They can. So here's how it works. I'll meet a female friend for coffee. I'm three for three on this. Hundred percent, three for three. I'll meet him for coffee and we'll just have a few laughs. And I'll say, hey, do you, are you a people watcher? Now, the answer is 100% yes. Who doesn't like to watch people? And then what I'll do is I'll use a pattern called quotes. Quotes simply means I'll talk about what I saw someone else do. The usefulness of quotes is if they don't like what I said, I can back up and say, hey, I didn't say it. 
That's just what I saw someone else do. So here's the story I tell them. I say, you know, me too. I was in this place the other night, the other day, excuse me, and I saw a couple on a bad date. Now, the way I could tell they were on a bad date is they obviously weren't able to feel that incredible connection. You know that click right there, those butterflies that let you know something big's going down. Instead, her body language was turned away. She was checking through her phone. Mm -hmm. You see how I'm building up the story and I'm betting and talking about little things like feeling a connection mm -hmm. and feeling butterflies. So I'm building up the story and I say, but all of a sudden things took a 180 and you won't believe what happened, Pearl? And naturally, you'll say, what happened? It's creating curiosity. Now I'm drawing you even further into the conversation. I'm creating curiosity. I'll say, well, all of a sudden, he just rubs the back of her neck like this. Now, the back of the neck happens to be a very erogenous zone. Most people don't know it. He leans over and he whispers something in her ear. And all of a sudden, she's all over him. She starts macking on him. She's grinding on him. She gets up to go to the bathroom, and I walk over to the guy and say, first of all, dude, you're my hero, but you got to tell me, what did you say? And then I'm quoting the guy, mind you, so she's off her guard. She's not expecting anything, Pearl. Um, well, I just leaned in her ear, and as I say this to whoever I'm talking to, I'll lean in her ear. He leaned in her ear and said, can you imagine our first soft electric brush of the lips and all the things we're going to do to each other when we finally get each other alone. I mean, honestly, did he really expect her to imagine that and feel compelled? <laughs> <to that? laughs> no. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, it's really and good. Too. And you're three for three on it? I'm um, three for three on it. <laughs> but let me break out the structure of it. Okay, the yeah, structure okay. of it is, first of all, I'm telling a story about somebody else. So it takes away any of the suspicion, any of the nervousness. Second, I'm talking about a theme that women are fascinated about. This is a generalization, which is good and bad dates. Everyone's seen a bad date. Everyone's seen a train wreck of a date. So naturally, they want to talk about it. Then I get attention by suddenly switching things up and saying how everything suddenly changed. That's going to create curiosity. Then I'm demonstrating the rub on the back of the neck. If you somewhere on the internet, there's a YouTube video. And sincerely, I really am not trying to plug myself. If you type, if you search Ross Jeffries erotic touch, mm -hmm. you'll see me demonstrating it on a very hot young Swedish woman. Who I wound up sleeping with. By the way, thank you, Sweden. Sweden has been very good to me. Uh, so is Denmark. Anyway, that gets them turned on. And then when I lean over and whisper in their ear, every woman I did this to said, I could feel the, the hot breath on my neck. I could feel your lips brushing against my ear. Um, I can't say without getting you banned, but one of them said my bleep was bleep. The other one said, I could feel my bleep tingling. And the other one said, you are not my type, but I am so turned on right now. <laughs> so this is just one of the ways. So those are two. I could give you a third <clears throat> if we have time. Excuse me for coughing. A little bronchitis. I was sick for two weeks. Is this, is this giving you some idea of what I do? Yeah, no, that makes sense. And then for an actual pickup, here's some things I would use to teach guys to start a conversation. So I believe humor is a really great way to start a conversation with a woman, not being a clown. If a guy just keeps telling you jokes, you're gonna walk away, you're gonna get bored, you're gonna think he's a weirdo, but using humor. Please give me the time to explain this, okay? Don't cut me off here. So I will do what I call a pre-opener. I'll just say nice shoes or, excuse me, do you mind if I reach for the milk? That's just designed to let her hear my voice and see I'm not going to harm her. And then I'll say, hey, I've got to ask, do you work for the Department of Defense? And when she says no, I'll say, because your eyes are weapons of mass distraction. Now, when she laughs, I'm not going to leave it there. 
I'm not going to leave it at the laugh. I'm going to say, okay, that was cheesy. But when I saw you, I thought she probably gets approached a hundred times a month. See if she has a sense of humor that would make her fun to talk to for a minute. So let me explain what I'm doing there. I'm getting the laugh, but then I'm owning it. I'm admitting that it was cheesy. And then I'm giving what I imply, I call an implied compliment. Notice what I didn't say, Pearl. I didn't say you're so beautiful you get approached 100 times a, mo a month. That would be like, I implied the compliment. I said, she probably gets approached 100 times a month. Now, it's, is that implying that she's a war pig? Or is that implying that she's hot? It's implying that it's mm -hmm. she's hot. So whatever you can get a person to imagine for themselves will be perceived by them as being their own thought, and it won't be resisted. It will be absorbed. And once it's absorbed, it'll be acted upon. Those are just three different examples of what I teach. I've been doing this 30 years. Um, and if it didn't work, I would have been kicked out of business by now. People would have, there would have been complaints and I would have been booted. So that's just something. Did that give you some good representative examples? Yeah, I'm curious. Is what you teach, like what they teach in modern day pickup, would you say? No. No, no, because I went to a PUA, day... I went to a PUA boot, boot camp a couple years ago. <laughs> and it was really interesting. Um, but I was I was curious if it would, would have been similar to what like you did. No, 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 no. Because PUA, uh, there's three schools of PUA. One of them is from Mystery Method and it revolves yeah. around demonstrating higher value, negging a woman, throwing something that's part insult, part compliment. Nonsense like that. I don't do that. My whole thing is how can I use language to capture, lead, evoke, amplify the emotions that I want a woman to look at me through? That's the whole difference in orientation. The other aspect of speed seduction is healing. How can you get past your own trauma and build a state that's attractive, that's not traumatized? And the third part is learning from your mistakes. Look, in an area of life that's emotionally difficult, where you've had a lot of challenges and a lot of failures, you can't expect to move logically up the learning curve. You're going to have places where you're looking at your possibility through the pain of your past. So I teach guys techniques to have a clear mind and to be able to quickly go up the learning curve and learn from their mistakes. Otherwise, you're just going to slide right back down because you're not going to see what you did right. My experience as a teacher and a trainer and a coach for 30 years has taught me that it takes discipline and training to see your wins. We are hardwired to look for what we did wrong. Your brain is not wired to make you happy. Your brain is, desire, is wired to keep you safe, which means you're going to look at your errors. It goes against the stream to learn to look at your small wins. So being able to build a vision that's not dependent on your emotions or on the events of the day is one of the skills I teach. And that goes, that can be used in business and any area of life. That That's a mouthful, but I'm a big talker. So what do you mean? Could you tell me more about like you said, you, you teach them to have like a clear mind almost? Yes, yes. So, Ever since 2006, 2006, my mom, who I, to this day, I still love, I, she's alive in my heart. My mom died of liver cancer. It was a slow, painful death that I had to watch her go through. Mm -hmm. And right around then, I, I had the need and my teacher showed up, my meditation teacher. He taught me Buddhist, um, I'm not a Buddhist, but the tools are very useful he taught me something called vipassana, mindfulness meditation. And with mindfulness, you don't try to tighten up or turn away from the emotion, but you don't tell yourself a story. You don't feed the fuels, fuel the fire, so to speak, with stories about it. You allow yourself to experience the raw emotion as it expands, as it contracts, as it gets larger, as it gets bigger. And through that practice, I was able to get rid of the storytelling and just experience the emotion. So I teach my students, I, well, I don't teach anymore. I do it all through the AI. But again, if they come out and pay me a, a bleep ton of money, 
I require my students to meditate, to do mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness is all the rage in psychology now, but I was doing it back in 2006. That has fundamentally changed my view of what it means to be human and how I walk through the world. It's taught me a little bit. I'm far, far from mastery. It's taught me how to be happy, independent of circumstances, and how to find peace, even in the midst of the worst chaos. And so what's different from my system? Yeah, Pua may teach you to get women here and there. In my system, you have to grow as a human being to get good at it. Sure, you can mouth and imitate and parrot my language patterns. But if you really want to get good at it, you have to grow as a human being. Had you met the Ross Jeffries from 10 years ago, I would have been insulting you. I would have been trying to tear you to pieces. I wouldn't, I honestly wouldn't have seen you as a human who has her pain, who has her failings, who also has genuine um, beliefs in what she's doing. I wouldn't have encouraged you where I think you're going right. But the person I'm showing up as today is due to that very practice that I teach my students. So that's another way in, in which it's profoundly different. So you, you, because if someone feels an emotion, you tell them to like feel it and not tell stories about it. What does that mean? So if I feel sad or happy, like what do you? So, so you're asking great questions. So what I mean by that is you experience the actual flow of emotions. Where do you experience it? Is it in your chest? Is it spreading? Is it static? Is it expanding and getting stronger? Is it contracting and getting smaller? Just pay, when my mother died, uh, I was I was just crippled with grief. I couldn't move. I would lay in my bed. I remember apply the practice. I instead of saying I shouldn't be grieving and why is this happening to me, I just let the raw waves of grief pass through my body. I didn't resist them. I didn't tie it up against them. I stopped the internal dialogue. I just let the raw feelings of grief move through my body. Now it's in my legs. Now it's going local in one spot. Now it's globally spread through my body. And by allowing it to happen without fighting it, within 30 minutes, it just broke up into waves of energy. And I was able to function. I was grieving, but I wasn't suffering to the point where I couldn't function. That's what I mean by it. Is that making it any more clear? Yeah, so it's almost like you're not telling stories about it and like thinking about yeah. all the stuff about your mom dying. You're just like yes. focusing on the emotion yes. and it makes it go away. Yes. And then you because have a clearer people, mind. Yeah, be, yes, because typically people make two bad choices. They either tighten up and turn away or they feed it with story. I learned, look, I'm just cooking with the ingredients my teacher Shinzen Young taught me. In my mind, he is the meditation, what Einstein was to physics. He made it available to me. He made it rigorous and scientific and no om, om, and worshiping statues and burning incense or other that, other, none of that nonsense. As you can see, even though we've had disagreements, I'm a very rigorous thinker. I appreciate science and logic and clear thinking. And he was the first person to make it available to me. So I teach my students that. Because again, in an area of life, it's not like learning to ride a bicycle. In an area of life where you've had a lot of failure, I've had students come to me and say, honestly, Ross, I had a bottle of bleach waiting in my uh, in back in my apartment, I was going to drink it. If this seminar didn't work, I've had guys tell me that he had the gun out in the nightstand. I had a student, brilliant composer from Canada. His name was Tristan. He told me at at the midnight, January and uh, New Year's Eve at midnight, he walked into the ocean and he got this close and he heard a little voice in his head say, "No, get on the internet." And he found me. So I joke around. I say things like, you don't get laid. I don't get paid. Get laid now. Ask me how. I joke around because I'm a provocateur. Uh, if I said, modulate your emotions and communicate in a way that trigger that blah, blah, blah. No, no one would sign up. Just like you have to provoke in order to get views. Even though now after this conversation, I've come to change my view of you. I think you really do believe 
most of what you're saying. You've learned to say it in a provocative way. In the same way, I have um, genuine compassion for my students, even, and I really care. I want to make a difference, even though I act like a a hole, because that's the Ross Jeffries persona. Mm -hmm. That's how Ross Jeffries gets views. That's how I do what I do, mm -hmm. in a different media form than you do. You're young and modern. I'm an old fart who's more excited about a nap than getting a woman. <laughs> oh, that actually makes sense. I, do you think young people need that more? Because we've all been on, ha had social media since we were like, like young. Because I was even thinking my, my sister's generation, they only hang out online. It's really weird. Like, um, because my, my generation, we got social media when I was like 13, maybe or 14. But like most of my childhood, we didn't have it. But my sisters, like they all had it from like super young. I think every human being needs it. I think we live in an increasingly nasty, chaotic, narcissistic, cruel world where we're divided more than ever. This wokeism is a cancer. I know, excuse me, I'm so sorry. I know that feminists... Uh, in many ways, uh, who's his, what's his name? The guy who runs 21 Convention likes to say feminism is a cancer. Well, I like to say that, um, that uh, wokeism is a cancer, self-indulgence is a cancer, and being able to learn how to be compassionate for yourself and to other people is the antidote to all of it. You can be controversial, but also compassionate. You can be flamboyant, but also genuinely care for other people. Ultimately, uh, my view of you has changed because of the way you've conducted this interview. I see you as someone who says things to provoke, but who basically does believe what she says and who has the maturity. I'm not being condescending. I'm being honest. And who has the maturity to change her views. And that takes courage. It takes tremendous courage to say, you know what? I've changed my views on it because I'm sure you're going to take heat from your fans. So I honestly do. I salute you for your courage and your tenacity and your work ethic. Your work ethic is better than mine or I'd be wealthier than I am. <laughs> Where did you get your work ethic? Was that influence? You don't have to answer. Did you get it from your mom? Um, I got it from my dad. From uh, your father? Yeah, my dad's like um Yeah, my my dad he he built like a software company. It had over wow. like um 200 employees and wow. yeah, and he um he built like a 10 bedroom house like himself. He just built wow. like um we he just made a shed. He's like in his 50s and 60s and he like is probably in better shape than most guys in their 20s. <laughs> and he, hey. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and he and he does like everything himself. So he like um, let me try to flex the packs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, he's like in a different type of shape. Like he doesn't lift or anything, but like he's just one of those guys that are like go go go. And so when I was like, um, how old was I? I remember I was like ten or or twelve, and I was a year young. I was a year young in school, um, and I always had like a hard time in school because. I, I was a year young, and when you're young, it's like, I don't know, it's like a bigger, anyways, and I was like 12, and I thought I was I was stupid, right, because I couldn't do math, or I couldn't do something, and then my right. dad, he, he told me, um, he said, you know, it doesn't matter, like, one, you're not stupid, and two, it's not about how smart you are, it's about how hard you work, and the older you get in life, I, he said, I would rather employ someone that works hard than is smart because you know you're young now and like talent wins now but you're going to get older and the people that work hard are going to win and i don't know it just kind of like stuck with me i guess so that yeah uh, as we say in hebrew kolakavod all the glory to your father good for him he taught his he would be he should be very proud of his daughter because you're living the work ethic yeah that he <laughs> gave you pearl yeah. Yeah. Thank did you. Did you expect me to be an asshole or did you expect, did you expect this or did you expect me to be a real a-hole to you? Oh no. I thought you'd be nice. I thought you were nice in oh. your videos. No, you're right. Yeah. I didn't think you were, um, 
No, no, because I was just curious. Like, I, I wasn't really trying to, like, go back and forth. I was just curious, like, what your thoughts were. Because I just, you seem like a smart guy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You forgot to mention a silver fox. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> you got lucky. He was very mean to me when, <laughs> when I first met him. He was was mean I to mean to you, Ice? Of course. Well, we were just playing around anyway. We were just playing, and uh, you took it well. We're still friends, so you took it well. Exactly. Yeah. Off the air, Pearl, I'll tell you who my famous niece is. I can't tell you on the air. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you for coming on. This was fun. You thank should you, come Pearl. you should come back. We'll do this again. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd be proud and happy. And again, congratulations on your work ethic and your success. And my hope for you is that you do continue to grow as you seem to be at the beginning of more nuanced than you're thinking. It'll it'll improve the power of your voice and and improve what you bring to the table. I really believe that. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you, Ice Ice White, for putting it together. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Uh, what are you going to do for celebrating 2 million subscribers when you get there? Very soon, I hope. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I didn't even do anything. You know what's funny? I didn't even do anything for 1 million. Um, like... <laughs> Bless, I didn't even order the plaque. Blessing did it for me. <laughs> I didn't like even order the plaque to what was I at? Like one five. <laughs> um yeah. so I don't I don't know. I don't usually do anything. I just say yay and I just keep going. Well listen, uh Dan Bilzerian <laughs> is willing to come on your show. So what he's busy right now, but once he's ready, he'll be ready to go. Oh shit, yeah. Yeah, he's lived an interesting life. He's that's a guy that slept with like a bajillion girls, right? Pretty much, yeah. He he almost bought Playboy, but he changed his mind uh, after Hugh has never died, of course. Mm -hmm. He changed his mind because uh, they stopped doing only women models, if you know what I mean. Oh, oh, dang. Um, well, he um. I don't know. I hear his stories, and my number one question is, how did you not, like, catch anything? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's oh, well, exactly. just, like, just like Ross, he has, like, this whole legitimate testing process. But I, I recommend you read his book, The Setup. He released it two or three years ago. Oh, really? It's um, very good. Well, do you guys want to tell people where they can find you? Yeah, they can find me at speedseduction.ai. You can get... It's like having the virtual me 24-7. You can go on there and try it for free. So it's speedseduction.ai. If you're willing to fork over a minimum of $50,000 for a weekend, go to seduction.com forward slash apply. But really, I don't do it anymore. You have to find me at speedseduction.ai. Thank you for that, Pearl. I appreciate it. And do you want to yes. tell them where they can find you too? Yeah, uh, I'm on YouTube, Game Global. Um, I also have my own AI, which is the AI wingman for online dating called MGAI, sh uh, short for Message Game AI, based on my book. Um, working on the second edition of that. But if you just Google um, or go to the website gameglobal.net, you can find a banner at the top, which will take you straight there. It's to give you... Uh, responses to your Tinder matches, Instagram messages, and much, so much more um, to get women on dates. And it's based on a lot of data over the years and uh, put together by real AI people who used to work at Google, um, as well as dating experts. So they're- And mine will tell you what to do once you get them on the dates to not spend money and actually get them in your- in your bed so they're complimentary not not competitive <laughs> mine will get you, you the date yeah oh, well, thank you for this yeah and guys i liked i he I, he had a really good pickup line on my show i don't remember what it was but i remember i remember i would have i would i liked the the date idea it was like roller oh wait my, my line? yeah yeah you you had something on the show that uh what are free things uh let's skip all the bullshit what are free things you would love to do for uh, first date was one of them and another one was let's skip all the bullshit how spontaneous are you uh no how adventurous are you and you said you love going rollerblading uh yeah. you like basketball <laughs> and i forgot what the other one was and uh yeah i i suppose someone uh, or plenty of people probably sent you lots of <laughs> messages copying those my messages. my shade on that would be if you could go somewhere 
where none of your friends would ever find out what you would do, where would you go? What would you be doing? <laughs> you ask good questions. I don't even know. Um... You don't have to answer that, but it's a okay. good question. So anyway, where when are we going rollerblading, man? <laughs> Anytime. I love rollerblading. Let's blade. <laughs> All right. Uh, of course, my, my wife is coming. Uh, if, if you want, you can come to our wedding. We're already married, but it's just the second ceremony. Uh, so come to Peru. We're going to um, have our wedding uh, at a beach resort, basically. Oh, wow. Where's my invite? <laughs> Uh, whatever. Is she <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, fine. Wait, wait. Is she converting? Is it a Jewish wedding? Uh, she's a Catholic and I'm an atheist. Oh, good for you. I'm an atheist too. All right. Okay, guys. I get... um, hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say bye to the, the chat. Guys, make sure you like the video on your way out and subscribe. Also, seriously, guys, I know I've been harping on this. I really like this. It smells so good. It smells so good. If you guys want to get the ladies, get this soap, get the lotion, tactical soap, like the video on your way out, just subscribe to